Hey everybody, Cole here with Classic Mini DIY. Today is Odd Jobs episode four. That's right, we are on the fourth episode of the random odds and ends jobs that I have on my Classic Mini, which is pretty indicative of owning a Classic Mini. There's always something little, there's always something big, there's really always something to do on these cars that'll keep you busy. But today's episode, I've got a few things that you guys have been asking for, as well as some of the stuff that I've needed to do on my car for quite some time. I'm still working through the giant to-do list that I have back on my wall over there, as well as adding stuff to it pretty much constantly. For those of you who don't know, my drive shaft fell apart on one side of my car the other day, and that's actually in the process of being repaired. I don't have the parts yet. They should get here tomorrow, which doesn't really mean anything to you guys because this odd jobs video is probably getting released at a different time anyway, but as far as the timeline goes, Car's still up in the air. I haven't gotten everything that I need for those drive shafts. And then hopefully when the drive shaft goes back in, I can get this car back on the road and rolling the way it should have been rolling uh, before things broke. But one other thing that I wanna mention before we get into all of the jobs is that I have released a merch store. Some of you probably already know this. I've posted it on Facebook, sent an email out about it, but I'm really pushing this merch store because the stuff in that store helps me make these videos for you guys. And then on top of that, all the proceeds help me do things like the seven port engine rebuild that I want to do later on in the spring. So if you haven't seen my website, check that out. It's merch.classicminidiy.com and I'll be adding stuff to this pretty regularly over the next couple months. In fact, I'll always be adding new stuff to it, so check back regularly. There's gonna be something new on the site most likely every time you visit. I've got some really funny shirts that I worked up using an old slogan from a classic mini ad. I thought it was just hilarious, so I thought that would be a really cool shirt. In addition, I have things like stickers for classic mini DIY. Those are for sale as well as all sorts of other fun, cool stuff. So if you're looking for a way to get cool things and support the channel, head over to that link above. The best part is that until the end of February, there is a coupon code available called Grand Opening. I know, super, super creative. But you can use coupon code Grand Opening and get 10% off your entire first order. Also, if you're a patron to the channel already, you have a special coupon code, which I'm not gonna share here. I know you guys, you thought I was gonna slip up and say it, but I didn't. If you're on my Patreon already, you get a little bit of extra off. You, you can head over to Patreon. There's a specific coupon code for just you guys. So big thanks to anyone who has already made orders on the site. It's been really cool. It's a learning experience for me. So if things don't go perfect, let me know, and I am happy to adjust the way that I run the store. All right, but that's enough of the commercial stuff for right now. I appreciate you guys sitting through that and checking out that site, but some of the odd jobs I have to do on the car are not actually jobs on the car. It's things in the shop as well. You know, I like to keep a tidy shop. I've said that in my old videos and it's still true, hasn't changed. I like things clean. So the first thing I'm gonna do is get the shop clean and I'm also gonna hang this cool chalk uh, like pin board that my wife gave me because she's not using it in her office anymore. And you might be wondering, house to house is my wife and her co-workers design blog. If you have any interest in home decor or uh, design and things like that in the house, head over to their website. It's house2house.com. But I'm gonna hang this up like right here. It's gonna be awesome. I'm gonna hang it right above my toolbox here and it's gonna look real good. So let's get that hung up. So the first job of the day is gonna be going around the car and greasing all of the main grease points on the car to make sure that everything is nice and uh, lubricated and works just right. Now the first place that I'm gonna do this on is the rear of the car. And generally, and generally for most cars, you have a grease point right here on your car. And that grease point is generally just is a small nipple on the end of the pivot joint for your rear radius arm. Now in my car, they're on the inside and under the car, not because they're supposed to be there, but mostly because I put them there when I put this together and uh, they weren't supposed to, but here we are, they're in the back now. And uh, in order to grease those joints, I actually have to get under the car. 
most of the time you'll actually be able to grease the joint from right here. Now for this job you don't need any sort of fancy grease gun, you just need something with a bendy arm and a canister style system for loading grease. In this case we're going to be using a fully synthetic chassis grease because I like synthetic grease and we also don't need anything high temp because this pivot joint is not getting high amounts of travel like a wheel bearing would for instance. But Let's get under the car and I'll show you what that nipple looks like so you know what you're looking for when you're greasing your car. Now what we're looking at here is pretty straightforward. It's simply just the nipple on the end of the radius arm pivot point. So this is where your grease gun is going to get attached to and then you can pump grease into the joint. Now the process for the front is very similar. You take your grease gun, you apply it to this nipple here, and the way that you can tell when you have enough grease is around the edges of your top arm up here, you'll actually see grease start to come through and press out of those joints. Now there's one last place that you can apply grease on the front and that is where the hub connects to the top arm and where the hub connects to the lower control arm. They have a small grease nipple that sits right at the base of this pivot joint and you can apply your grease gun here and press grease into these fittings as well. Now one thing I mentioned needing to do on my last odd jobs video was replacing this side of the drum brakes with a proper spacered drum and I had one of them sitting around I needed to actually replace it with. One drawback though is that I don't have the screw that goes into this uh, mounting bracket here. But it's not the end of the world right now. I'll at least get this new drum on. I'll leave the tire off until I can order a screw to replace this. But for right now, I'm taking out this free spacer and I'm going to be replacing this with a hub that has a spacer built into it. Now you may be wondering, why did they ever make one without a spacer and why do they sell one with a spacer now? And the reason for it is that the Mini actually had drum brakes around the whole car when it first got released. So that meant that you had this drum style brake on every single wheel. And as such, it actually took up less room. It didn't stick out as far. But later model Minis and a lot of people making conversions will put discs on the front of the car. And when you do that, it actually bumps the wheels on the front of the car out a little bit. Specifically, the distance of the spacer. So the solution was to create a drum that actually had a spacer built into it, or you could get these free spacers. These, I'm not totally wild about free spacers. I feel like it's a uh, kind of unnecessary weakness in your suspension system. But for the longest time, as you can see, I was rolling with the spacers. In fact, I've had these on the car pretty much as long as I can remember. So for what it's worth, it hasn't actually caused any problems with my rear braking system. That said, I'd rather have the right thing on the car. So I'm going to be taking off the stock drum and the spacer and replacing it with this spacer drum. Unfortunately, getting back here, it looks like this uh, brake cylinder on the back plate on this side has had a leak and has burst in some way. So I'm actually going to have to take that off and take a look at that. Um, I wondered why this side seemed like it wasn't braking very good and it was because this is actually getting oil and grossness on the actual brake shoes. So I'm going to take these, I'm probably going to have to replace them because they're covered in oil. Thankfully I've got an extra set in my garage, but we'll actually need to get this brake booster off the back here. So let's go ahead and take that off. Now for those of you with a keen eye, you probably noticed that I had forgotten to uh, put jack stands under this end of the car. Unfortunately I don't have a lot of jack stands, so I just am using these wood blocks as, uh, as a support. Now hopefully you can see on the back here, there is a brake line going into a female port, and that is your brake reservoir for your rear drums. And then below that you have your bleed nipple for when you're bleeding your brakes. Now this job unfortunately requires me to disconnect my brake system. What that also means is that I'm going to have to bleed my brakes after this and I'm going to have to disconnect my brake system. So the whole brake system is going to bleed out into a catch can on this side here. My catch can is a super cool box filled with uh, uh, paper here because my normal catch can is way too big but let's disconnect that brake line and when you're disconnecting it, 
Make sure that you're not super aggressive with it because you don't want to break these copper lines. They have a tendency to break. As you can see, my brake system is now dripping out. That is all of your brake fluid and it will slowly leak out until it is 100% gone. Now in addition to getting that brake line disconnected, you also have to get a small retaining clip loose off the back of the brake system here. And that can be a little bit difficult, but with a little bit of prying and a little bit of pushing, you should be able to get that off there. All right, so I was able to get that small retaining clip off and it looks like this. This clip goes around the base of this reservoir here. It's tight on there, but usually you can push it off with a pair of needle nose pliers. Now, after you disconnect that piece there, the only other thing that you need to loosen up and remove is the brake bleed nipple. Now this brake bleed nipple is a 9 30 seconds wrench. If you haven't heard me complain about American sizes yet, well, now's your time. That is one of the more ridiculous sizes that I've had to deal with as an American using uh, wrenches here. But once you get that loosened off, it should just screw right off. Make sure you hold on to that. It's very important. So set that aside with that clip. And then from there, your brake reservoir should just lift right off of the back plate. Like so. And there you have it. Now let's take this inside and see if we can figure out why it was leaking. All right, so let's take a deeper look into this and figure out why it was leaking, or at least where it was leaking from, and then we can diagnose it and get a new part ordered and put in the car. I'm also gonna show you guys exactly how you can tell whether this is happening to your brakes and uh, how to fix it in the future. Kind of lucked out. Well, you guys lucked out because now you can see how this stuff breaks, but I didn't luck out so much because I gotta replace this, but anyway, but before we dive into the actual broken system here, let's go ahead and look at how you can tell whether this is happening to your car. Now, this is a standard brake shoe. This is a brand new shoe. It's not been used anywhere. It's, it's brand spanking new. And because it's new, there's no oil on the back of the shoe. More specifically, even if it wasn't new, there should not be oil on the back of this. But in the case of my car, when I opened up that drum, I found that these brake shoes were almost pitch black. You can see they are just incredibly dirty. They are not the way that they should look. And when we compare them here, there's a pretty stark difference between the two. You can see one's pitch black, one's kind of a grayish color. And what that immediately said to me is there's oil on these. But given that these shoes are in the back of the car, there's no engine oil that's going to get on these things. So where could the oil be coming from? Well, before I was totally certain that there was oil on these, because sometimes they do get a little darker, but not quite this dark, I looked inside my drum. And now if we take a look inside this drum here, we've got a lot of brake dust, but the difference between this brake dust and regular brake dust is it's kind of like damp feeling. It's not the regular powdery dust that we'd be used to seeing on the inside of a drum. So at that point, we bring into the equation the brake cylinder in the rear. Now these brake cylinders are where the actual brake fluid goes and it fills up this reservoir and then pushes these two pistons out the outside of the brake piston. And that is what pushes these brakes into the drum. So I took a look at it and saw immediately that there was oil leaking out of it. Now these have a rubber seal around it. This is what the rubber seal should look like. It's pretty sealed. It's sealed all the way around. There's no cracks, there's no dents. It's intact. If we take a look at the other side, that is not the case. Let's rotate that around. And you can see there's a huge crack, a huge tear in this brake cylinder. And how that happened, I'm not really sure, but sometimes these things happen. And this is what keeps us busy on the classic minis and keeps us fixing them and repairing them. So let me see if I can get this rubber off and we can take a little bit deeper look into this brake piston. So. So as you can see here, this is very torn. I tore it up a little bit more while I was taking it off, but you can see there's a pretty big gash out of it. And then you have your piston inside here. 
This is what gets moved up and down and pushes your brakes out. You can see inside there, that's where all the brake fluid goes when it uses when it pushes this piston out. And without that rubber gaiter there, as well as the actual brakes attached to the cylinder, the piston just slides right out. So it's pretty straightforward. The system here is not very complex. So when you press your brake, it pushes the fluid into this actual cylinder. Now I don't know if you guys can see that there, but in the back inside the cylinder there's a small little hole and that corresponds to where your brake line goes in. Brake fluid pushes, pistons get pushed out, and your brakes stop your car. And that's the principle on how all of your brakes work. Your brakes are hydraulic, aside from the parking brake, that's driven by a wire. Otherwise, your brakes are driven by hydraulic fluid. So when you press your pedal, it pushes that pressure into the front brakes as well. So if you have disc brakes, it pushes it into the calipers. And then the caliper push the pads and clamp down on the disc. But unfortunately, I'm gonna have to get a new one. I'm gonna have to put this on that back plate. But I will be videotaping that, don't worry. That'll be in Odd Jobs episode two or maybe just a short little video. I can show you guys repairing that. But for right now, that actually wraps up this episode of Odd Jobs. I was gonna do a little bit more, but I, but I spent the majority of my afternoon doing this rear break and showing you guys how that works. So I don't have enough time to actually fit in any more jobs today. But I'll catch you guys on the next Odd Jobs video where we'll replace this and get new shoes put in the rear drum, as well as adding the spacer to the drum on the back as well. But until next time, check out the merch store and motor on.